Hello and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm joined by Joe Barthlett from Wood and Weather Drum Shop. Joe, welcome to the podcast. Hey, Bart. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's good to have you here, man. This is I like doing the ones about shops um, because I've, I've done a few. I did Nelson Drum Shop, and I guess that's really it so far. So you're kind of uh, on a short list of, of, of shop-related episodes, which I hope to do more. But um, we've met, I think, a few times at the drum show's over the years, which is always a pleasure. Um, Mm -hmm. But you've built really kind of a cool vibe. Um, I think that's a big part of making a drum store nowadays is like, I don't know, it's different than like Guitar Center and things like that. Obviously, you kind of have to have your like your your personality comes through um, through social media and through pictures because online ordering and stuff, it's really your your face of the shop is online. Um, So Lots of stuff to talk about with that. But before we start, why don't we just uh, hear more about you and uh, and your background a little bit and then how you started a drum shop? Because you're a young guy. You said you're 30, right? Yep. yep. Just uh, this past December. OK. Um, it's pretty cool to think about like starting a business and having a shop. And you really you you the shop isn't like really brand new. Like you've been doing it for a while. Mm-hmm. Um, so. Yeah, let's just jump in here and uh, maybe tell us about your background and what led to starting a drum shop at a young age. So um, I guess it probably would have started when I started playing the drums, um, age 14. Um, And then kind of just from there, I played consistently throughout my life. And it wasn't until maybe um, I was 18 or 19 that I found my first vintage set. Um, up until then I was kind of just playing whatever my, you know, favorite drummers at the time were playing, whether it be like a custom set or, uh, or whatnot. Um, yeah. but yeah, I, uh, stumbled across a crazy deal on Craigslist for this like 63 blue sparkle Ludwig kit that I think it had been in a fire. The superphonic that came with it was like black mm. and I don't know what spoke to me about it, but maybe it was just something new for me and it was uh you know it was only like a couple hundred bucks you know back then on craigslist stuff would just sit there for that price yeah (laughs) um so yeah i got that kit and uh spent a lot of time with it and you know went through it cleaned it all up and i guess that was like you know it sparked something in me i think as a younger kid i was always like into Legos and like building stuff and like working with my dad in the garage and whatnot. So I think, you know, when I got my hands into that kit, it just like brought back this feeling. And also like when I got the kit done and I set it up and played it, I just like never heard anything like it, you know, playing modern drums for the past, you know, decade and a half. Um, So it just like changed my mind and kind of spiraled from there. And became like collecting and collecting and yeah and now well, I mean, we're here <laughs> and now you're here and which i will hear about the shop too but like really like i don't know things are different when you work on something it's just different you know what i mean when your hands are on something and it's just um it means more than just like buying a drum set and the fact Definitely. that it's vintage i mean you're obviously a primarily vintage shop but you have newer stuff i mean yeah. you obviously sell a lot of things but um, so you got into that, but what, what, what made you want to start a drum shop? Because obviously you don't go from having one kind of, uh, restored drum kit to being a business owner. There's gotta yeah. be something in between there. Yeah. So I guess from there, it, it kind of just accumulated, it became collecting and then it became, you know, attending the drum shows, um, meeting different collectors and whatnot. And then just like, you know, at this point I was living in a really small apartment and then, you know, one of the two bedrooms was floor to ceiling, uh, drums. So at some point I was, I was starting to sell them and it, and it, and it started as a lot of local people coming by and and I made a lot of relationships that way. And then it started to, you know, become, oh, there's these forums and I'm meeting all these people on these forums and, and those people are wanting the drums. And, you know, I think I'm a bit blessed being in New England. There's a lot of music and a lot of makers around here. So I think we're just like really flush with some really cool drums. So it just kind of became this thing where I was starting to sell drums and it just, 
became, you know, it took over my life to the point where I quit my day job at the time to just try it. You know, I was just, you know, wanted to try something new. I was still playing in bands and touring and stuff like that. So it was something nice that, you know, didn't have a, a strict schedule. Yeah. I mean, you you probably I'm assuming you feel the same way I do, where like from playing in bands and being the drummer where we all know that we're like, I mean, like physically, we're always kind of in the back, even with the writing. Usually we're kind of in the, you know, the back of it. But like, like it's your baby. You know right. what I mean? Like you have built it. And I feel the same way with this stuff of like, um, you know, you've grown it, you've created it, you are the brand, you're the face of it. Yeah, yeah, it's exciting. And it's nice to like, you know, it's a good way to meet other people that are passionate about this kind of stuff, too. Yeah, which there's no shortage of. I, I can attest to that from being at the drum shows is like, I mean, you just got to like, it can be a little intimidating at first to like step into even from being like, longtime drummers to step into that world of like, collectors mm. and people who know so much yeah i think if you go in open-minded and like ready to learn that like people young and old uh are happy to and people who like i mean there's guys who are like wearing button-down shirts and who are older successful businessmen down to like um young tattooed ruffians who are walking around and like in crocs, <laughs> crocs <laughs> especially the crocs you mm -hmm. got to watch out for that uh no but like it's just this we should we have a shared passion you know yeah totally and i think it's you know meeting a lot of those people is kind of what you know kept me inspired to it so that's why i think the the drum shows are super important too you yeah. know yeah and you said about collecting in uh, Massachusetts and New England. It's like there's you guys just have older stuff, not just drums, but like right. it's just an older part of the country where there is just so much more historical items to be found. Yeah. Uh, and I don't think I realized that for a long time, but, you know, it's it's the visiting people that kind of remind me of it. They're like, oh, there's, you know, especially we have a lot of uh, surrounding towns that were built around water. So there's a lot of these old, like, you know, 1800s, 1900s buildings that were, you know, powered by water. Mm -hmm. And, you know, everyone's like, oh, look at these cool old buildings. And I've, you know, I've seen them my whole <laughs> life. So it's not anything new and maybe nothing I like paid too much mind to. Yeah. But it's sure, true, you know, and there's stuff kind of, you know, I meet other collectors of other things just inherently from dealing with the vintage things so it's like you meet all these people that you know maybe they collect vintage rugs or, or couches or motorcycles or radios and it's there's no shortage of any of that stuff around here so it's yeah. cool to kind of like see a little bit of everything around yeah for sure um all right so you had your apartment full then what what was the jump from like you know selling drums out of your apartment to like a brick and mortar shop. You said you were doing the shows you were collecting. You were, I'm sure it's like the classic, like filling your car up, going, selling things, coming mm -hmm. home with the car, just as full with different stuff. Cause I'll say on social media and stuff, you kind of post your, like your like haul that you got, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And like, it's just awesome. I mean, there's so much stuff that you're getting. So, um, which those are two separate things we can talk about, but what, what led to you getting a brick and mortar shop? Um, so for me, I think it was a combination of a few things growing up around here. There wasn't really like there was music stores and, you know, not everywhere has like a drum specific store, but I think it was a combination of not having something inspiring for a music store in the area and then traveling to other stores, you know, like drum center Portsmouth or, or revival or pro drum and experiencing these places and, you know, wishing that I had something like that growing up mm. in this area. Um, so it was a combination of, of inspiration and also like filling something that I thought was a void. I mean, that's like what, like, I don't know with like businesses, it's like, that's a great reason to do something. It's like, well, it's not here. I want it to be here. Other people will probably want it to be here. So right. I'll do it. But I mean, it's not super easy, though, to like, you know, 
taxes and inventory and <laughs> yeah. pricing and employees and stuff like that. Have you, um, did you kind of take to that pretty easily or did you find yourself getting <laughs> a no. lot of, a lot of no. learning? Uh, yeah. And I'm still figuring it out. It's like, uh, you know, I'll tell everyone first, it's like, I'm a drummer first and I, and a collector and I, I like working on them. It's the business side of things that I am like, mm -mm. I have a great, yeah. great accountant and that keeps me sleeping at night. Yeah. Um, and great employees too. So everyone's understanding as we're all figuring it out together, but you know, yeah. drums are always first and foremost. So I'm kind of always in that zone. So when it comes time to do like business stuff, I'm always like ripping my hair out kind of, and yeah. but it's, it's a part of it, you know, it can't all be fun and drums, but no, because it, it, it could seriously just like it could ruin your business to not correctly do it uh, and have too much fun with the drumming. But it's smart to delegate to someone who like who knows what it is, because you're I mean, having a business like a really like a store is different than like, um, I don't know, kind of collecting on the side or doing online sales. It's like you're you're on the, the radar mm. of like the government. Right, <laughs> so right, like right, right. I know. Right. Yeah. yeah, it's not all just like cash deals and you know, yeah, no receipts. Yeah, yeah. What year did you start the shop? Mm. Um, so I started um, as this as like my official job in 2015, um, but I don't think I officially called it like a shop for another couple of years. So technically, that we've been like an LLC for five years. Okay. Um, in our sixth now. Wow. Um, so yeah, the first iteration after the apartment was, uh, we were in like an industrial park, at, uh, a few towns over, um, kind of like, a, you know, one of these buildings that we were just talking about earlier is a five story building built in like, uh, the turn of the century and, you know, a lot of old wood and old brick and, and that was the first iteration of like it being a, a brick and mortar. Yep. Yep. Which, I mean, I have been in since 2013, a big hundred thousand square foot music space in downtown Cincinnati, which was like a carriage factory. And then they made like wreaths there and mm -hmm. then they made um, baseball gloves and, and just it is. But there's so many problems that come with that where there's no heat. There's no AC. Mm -hmm. This is like like music space for like rehearsals or yeah, artists. Yeah. But um but it's like everything's cracking all the time. There's like lead paint all over the place. <laughs> right, so right. Uh, problems come with that, which I'm sure yours was probably more updated than the one I've uh, been in. But a little bit. It was it had heat in the winter, which is beautiful. Uh, yeah. A lack of air conditioning in this in the summer and being on the fifth floor, it would get kind of hot up there. Luckily, we had these windows that were just like floor to ceiling and they would just pop open. So we would just have all those open and it kept it cool yeah. enough in there. Um, and some dehumidifiers and stuff just for the drums themselves. But yeah, it was definitely like, you know, old wood, yep. lead paint, you know, yep. pipes running across everywhere. Luckily, exactly. We never had any leaks or anything, but yeah, yeah super old building. Yeah, that's what they they say though is it's not the heat that gets you, it's the humidity. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Especially mm -hmm. with music with music gear. I'm sure that's stuff you've learned. Oh, but I know. Especially with all these old drums with the calf heads and stuff like that. Every once oh, yeah. in a while you hear a little pop and it's like, what was that? You know? <laughs> yeah. Um so social media, I mean, in our in, in five years ago, it's not like something where it's like you started this twenty years ago and social right. media didn't really exist. So it's always been a thing. Did you know right off the bat how important it is for your business um, or did that kind of grow as you go, you know, as you went? Um, I think I realized it right away. Um, it was definitely a different beast then than it is now. And I think the growth of all of it is kind of weird timing. You know, it, it was almost like still early with, you know, let's say Instagram and stuff like that. Yeah. So I think it's still being like, uh, kind of a fresh thing. I think it really helped a lot with myself and others that were kind of doing similar things at the time. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I mean, if it's early and I'm, I'm looking at yours right now, like if it's, if it's early enough, I don't know, it's less like saturated where right. 
um, I think now there's a lot of awesome shops um, that are out there, but everyone's on social media. It's it's almost like uh, like my brother does a lot of like art, like painting and stuff mm-hmm. like that. And it's like it's hard for like that world to like stick out on social media because everyone's kind of posting the same thing. So mm-hmm. I've been trying to help him figure out what to do. It's similar with drums where it's like, you know, a lot of shops have the same. It's like we all have vintage gear. We all have symbols. Uh, we all have nice cameras. We everyone has a nice camera. <laughs> everyone has a phone that's right. like super nice. Right. So, it's twenty twenty two. It's like so much. It's easy to make like really cool content. Not easy, yeah. but yeah, a little bit more achievable, I think, than it was even just five years ago. And I yeah. think you know, kind of going back to that, I think it was like, at least for me, I had never like seen much of like people selling through Instagram and like social media and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so it seemed kind of like a new thing and, and it was working and, um, it was an interesting way to meet a lot of, especially like younger, because I, I guess when I started collecting and stuff like that, it, it inherently was a lot of, you know, older guys, which was great because the knowledge was there. Um, but it took me a while to find people like around, you know, my age that we're mm-hmm. collecting. And I think that, uh, I think I credit social media to that. I would agree. I think, I don't know. I think it's gone away, but there was maybe still is a little bit of connotation with like, you know, Oh, social media is so like dumb and things like that. But like, like parents would say that, but it's mm-hmm. like, well, if you're into something, you'll find that. Like if you like right. football, you'll find football stuff. If you like gardening, you'll find gardening stuff. It's just where you can like, go to be with other like-minded people. But totally. I do, th- I do think that the benefit to getting out there and going to shops and going to the drum shows, um, is just, it's, there's such a big difference from just talking to people online. You kind of need both. Yeah. You know? I mean, we get it all the time. If I get, um, someone traveling in, whether like, you know, I followed you forever on Instagram and you know, they're happy to be here. And then when they walk in, they're like, this doesn't, you know, Instagram doesn't do it justice. Yeah. And I'm, and I'm glad, it? but I'm also, sometimes I'm like, Hmm, I like wonder <laughs> how I could make it look how people see it. Yeah. But I also am like, Oh, that's a good thing. Cause then I guess if they're talking to someone else, I can be like, Oh, it's like, wait, it's better or, or exceeds expectations rather. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which is good because if they're saying good things about the Instagram and then, it exceeds that I'm doing a good job, I guess. Yeah. I don't know. There's like, there's like a, uh, there's a different, um, like your senses are, are engaged when you actually mm. go somewhere. We all know that, but like, smell like the, the, the smell of vintage, exactly. And you can like, <laughs> st- you can touch it and you mm-hmm. can like talk to you a little bit more personally, because I think we're all, uh, it's different getting an Instagram message or an email versus physically talking to someone in person or even totally. on the phone where it's like, um, and in your case, as a drum seller, um, you know, it's like, it's cooler to be like, yeah, I bought this. I bought this at wooden weather, you know? And it's like, this is like from the actual shop and I was there and I got a story to tell about this right. particular drum, you know? Yeah, definitely. So 2015, I mean, man, to have a drum shop running for that long is pretty impressive. Ha- has it been smooth sailing or did COVID hit you pretty hard or did you kind of do more online at that point? Obviously I would imagine. Yeah. I mean, we were kind of always heavy online, um, which I love it. You know, we've always had the local people and we've always had people travel in, but COVID actually, you know, there was some silver lining to it where kind of in the midst of it was when we moved to this new location. So there was, you know, we weren't allowed to be open anyway. So we had all this time with the doors closed to get this shop, you know, up and running and build walls and paint and build shelving. So we had all this downtime, um, that we would have been down for anyway, but it was kind of like, uh, a good excuse to have the door locked, I guess. Yeah. For lack of better way of explaining it, you know? Yeah. I mean, COVID is terrible for so many reasons, but I think if if there was a lot of ways to like benefit from the time, which obviously you did, yeah. um, you know, what would you, any advice you would give to folks who are like, 
uh, not to be like giving your competition ideas or, <laughs> but like, you know, if people are like selling some, cause I've actually talked to a lot of people on Instagram who, who sell some drums and they've got like an online drum shop. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know any advice for your people who, who are kind of have it as a hobby that you would say like how to take it to the next level. That's a good question. Um, you know, I think the, the main thing I think is just keeping it authentic, you know, regardless um, it's easy to, uh, take influence and maybe turn it into something that's a little bit too close to the original. Um, and sometimes it happens unintentionally, but I think it's just like, you know, staying true to yourself and, you know, putting out a vibe that, you know, to just true to you. I think that's yeah. the best thing I can say. And kind of how I've run this place is just, you know, I've always gravitated towards things I like and curated in that way. Yeah. And you know, that's totally, that's how I've always done it. Do you find that you, um, cause you've been doing it for a while and like Bryson Nelson's been doing it for a long time. Do you find that you see, um, I don't want to say copycat, but like that there's been like inspiration of a certain aesthetic of drum shops that has popped up that is like kind of uh like leather and like dark woods and kind of that vintage feel that's like spread across a lot of shops where again you were really early with it where it's it's become a bit of a style uh with drum shops which is inevitable i mean what are your thoughts on on that um i think it comes with the territory of like vintage anything um and you know there's there's times where it, it seems that way, but it's, it's not a new idea. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a million thrift stores around here and, and coffee shops and, and, and what have you that you walk in and they have the same stuff. And it's totally. like, it's, it's barn wood, it's leather, it's, you know, copper stuff like that. Yep it's inherently it's, it's a popular style. So when you're dealing with like a vintage instrument that, you know, that style lends well to that instrument, you know, this 1930s drum, that's mahogany and it's, you know, it's all got a dirty nickel all over it. And it looks beautiful next to this like Chesterfield sofa. It's like, totally. It, it, it kind of goes hand in hand. So I don't know. I think it's just inspiration and um, it's hard to claim something like that when it's such like, a, you yeah. know, any second hand in a, in a vintage kind of world, that's like a popular style, you know, I totally I with would, that yeah. too. There's been like a point where, you know, that I, th- I agree with you that it's a popular thing now. Um, and I've got rid of almost all of my leather stuff here. So, <laughs> just to like i mean it's we funny we painted it's, the walls red we painted the walls green they're blue we're getting like a new big red sign we're kind of just going into color blocky cool um you know it's just as you can see you know yeah like loud like yeah. different and yeah. it's just it's myself translated into a drum shop and you know everyone's yeah. style changes over the years so you know, a few years ago, the leather and, and, and all the old stuff kind of fit in and, you know, was wearing old jeans and stuff like that. And now it's like a little bit different. So yeah, just kind of changes with, with, you know, for me personally changes with myself. Sure. And in five years, it'll look like an Apple store with like one drum. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) dude. I have like, (laughs) it's coming dude, because I I have like way too much stuff here. So the next generation is yeah one drum yes exactly this is the drum (laughs) i'm offering today Um, yeah welcome to my store here's the drum here's the drum yeah (laughs) it is literally a drum shop yeah um but like i do think it's cool though like i am i've always been obsessed with like flea markets and antique stores and just finding stuff and like you know you obviously are it or you're there you find stuff that are beyond just drums so i think it's cool also to like have shops where like you can have like little like I, I uh, affectionately call them knickknacks or something, mm-hmm. just like cool vintage stuff around a shop that like 
uh, it's a good way to like showcase your personality, right. uh, like you said, where you can like, and even like the logos and um, t-shirts and things like that. There's a lot of ways to like express who you are through your shop. And I think that's the, um, just, just the, how, how you really connect with people like authentic. It's just being authentic totally. to you. So I think that comes across really well. Oh yeah, yeah. Thank you. And I think, you know, I tell people all the time, it's kind of like a big art project to me, you know, personally, especially, you know, designing shirts and, you know, laying out the floor and, you know, painting and all this and that it's, it's, it's a big vision rather than just like, Hey, we're just selling drums, like buying them on Craigslist, flipping them. It's like, it's kind of a bigger picture, you know? Yeah. Yeah. How do you deal with like time management? Because you have a daughter, which how, how old is your daughter now? You turned two today. Oh, like Man. a good dad, here I am at work, right? Yes, but <laughs> y- you are in for, uh, it's about to get wild, let oh, me tell you, my friend. Uh, she's and there. Then, <laughs> but uh, time management, how do you deal with that? Good question. I don't know if I do. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I try to have breakfast with my family every morning and get to the shop by 10, sometimes a little bit earlier. Um, and just kind of head down from there. Um first priority is kind of always shipping and, and emails and stuff like that, boring stuff. And, you know, take a little breaks throughout the day to play the drums too, because sure. Part of it, little release. And also, you know, a lot of people just like to know how stuff sounds. So it's, yeah, it's nice to keep myself acquainted with a lot of this stuff. Um, but other than that, I have, you know, a really, really great, um, shop manager here that helps out a lot with that he's on a little bit better of a schedule than i am so he keeps us a little bit more on track while i'm just like you know running around like a chicken with my head cut off you know like the other day i drove to like york pennsylvania in one day like there and back spent the whole day like left at 4 a.m got back at 1 a.m like whole day and then come in the next day and i'm like (laughs) Can't even think straight, but you know, my shop guy, Colin is kind of just like keeping me in line, making sure we're getting the stuff done that that needs to be done and making sure that customers are taken care of and stuff. Awesome. What did you get on that uh, trip? A lot. That's like my, my most recent post. I, it's, uh, you know, like maybe 10 sets or something like that. Wow. Do you like kind of plan out? like line up with people in a particular town like like i'm coming this day and like searching i don't give away your secrets or whatever are you like <laughs> no, searching I craigslist secrets at this point <laughs> um, for like in that town and lining things up or are you going to thrift stores or how's that work so sometimes it all it takes is like one or two to kind of like start the trip so you know i'll use this one for an example so this last one i had two kits to go get in york so from there, I reach out to a couple of people, you know, collectors, other, you know, smaller shops and stuff like that, and just see if people are around. And then from there, you know, I usually line up a couple. So at least it's, you know, there's a few things that I'm getting, but either way, the trip is to York. So it's like, if that's the only destination, that's it. Like that was the plan. Um, so from there, yeah, it's, I guess, doing the normal stuff, marketplace and Craigslist and stuff like that, which are a lot harder to do ahead of time, especially nowadays. There's a lot of hobbyists and, you know, people that like to flip drums, people that like to play them. So it's hard to like compete, I guess, ahead of time. A lot of good deals and stuff is usually day of or, Mm. or whatnot. So, and sometimes it's feeling people out too, but yeah. um, Yeah. It's it's a, it's a mixture of planning and, and free form. Sure. I mean, and you like, uh, with your job, like you have to get a good deal, like on the drums for right. there to be like meat on the bone to sell it to like, you're like making a living at it. So I'm sure you run into people who don't really understand that and are asking like retail prices for the drum set, but right. you can't be paying what you're, you can't make $30 on a drum set right. that you just drove know, like, right. all night for. Uh, yeah. So sometimes it, there's like, a little bit of explaining and most of the time if something's out of like the range that it would work for me i won't even entertain it or won't even bother the person it's like i'm not here to like 
top them down too much. And sometimes with like the higher price stuff where maybe it's been sitting for a while, I'll, I'll approach the person and be like, Hey, if you know, down the road, if you want to take less, like, here's what we could offer. You know, it's something that our shop specializes in. So sometimes it's a little bit easier yeah, um, to move, especially, you know, for some people, I think it's like, you know, you don't, not everyone wants to just buy a drum set from Joe Schmo or, or whoever, like, you don't know what's inside of it. You don't know if everything's accurate, if there's any like credibility, like, on the mm-hmm. other side of like you get the drums and then you open it up and the inside's torched and you're like, well, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so Oops. there's something to like getting from like a store and it's yeah. like, we've already gone through this stuff. And yeah, so there's a little bit more security, I think, buying from, from someone within us. Oh, a totally. Name, you know? Yeah. Have you had the experience that, uh, you hear about it where someone's like, uh, I'm sure there's now better ways again with cell phones where you can snap a picture, but like um, where someone says like an older lady or something says like, Oh, I've got a Ludwig drum set. Mm -hmm. But in reality, it's a like, you know, Chinese cheap, cheap drum set with a Ludwig head. Have you run into that a fair amount? Um, It happens. I'll see it on Craigslist all the time. And it's usually stuff that just like sits there. Sometimes I'll try to educate, but most of the time people just, don't take it well. So I, yeah, you know, no. let them, let them live with it. <laughs> um, but it happens or it's like on the other side where you're like, Oh, it's a, you look on Craigslist and it's like Remo drum set or Evans drum set. And yep. it's a sixties Ludwig and it's like a hundred bucks or something, you know? Yeah. So there's yes. like both. Yeah. That's awesome. And sometimes you kind of feel like you need to like tell that person, like you have a really good thing, but oh yeah, I'd, I'd also kind of be like, uh, here's your hundred dollars. <laughs> <laughs> so with, yeah, and that's it. So with that stuff, um, you know, I didn't, I wasn't always like this, but I think in the beginning, you know, I would, I would take the hundred dollar drum set and run. But I think now that we're like bigger, we're a bigger operation. We're definitely like commanding like a full price, you know? Um, so if something comes up, that's like a hundred bucks and it's a $1,500 drum set we're I'm definitely like giving more. Sure. You know, I might not yeah. give a thousand dollars, but you know, maybe yeah. it might be five. It might be eight. Depends what it is. It's kind of like a case by case thing, but I always try to pay out like more if it's like, if it's like a screaming deal like that, it's just like yeah. karma. You know, I was just going to say it, it will come back to bite you later in some right. way. If you're right. ripping or, off or the other some old lady way around where it's like, I'm doing that. So then sometimes I've had it where the person, you know, they're super appreciative and they're like, Hey, I actually know someone else with uh, a drum set, an old drum set too. Like, let me call them and I'll see if I can like, you know, make that happen. So it's kind of like, you know, it helps with that side of the karma where it's like, uh, you know, if I hadn't paid up for that one, they might've just, the deal would yeah. have been done and then that's it. Yeah. 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 yeah for sure. Um, I feel like I know the answer is probably yes, but do you still get the like the tingly happy feeling when you get just find something ultra rare? I mean, is it still just as exciting for you as it ever was to go hunting? Definitely. It's definitely, uh, I get the feeling still. It's just, it's changed. Um, so it's, it's rarer stuff that takes it now. So I'm a little bit numb, I guess, but it's not only rare stuff. So it's like rare or just interesting or oddly modified. Anything like that is exciting. Like, even if it's, it doesn't even have to be that cool of a kit. If it has like a really interesting modification or maybe someone like redid it in like the fifties. So it's like, you know, 70 year old paint but it's not original, but it's yeah. still like this crazy, like, you know, illegal paint that probably would kill you nowadays. <laughs> yeah. Don't lick the drums. Like, right. But it <laughs> looks crazy, you know, and it, and it's not original and it maybe isn't worth that much, but it's just like a really cool piece, just something different and unique. So a lot of the, anything like that really, you know, is what keeps me going. Yeah. 
It's interesting how that works with like a modification that was made super long ago is cool, but something that was done in like 2010, not right. not well, yeah. you know, I mean, it, it kind cool. of plays into like the time periods, though, because if so, you got like a more recent modification, it's probably, you know, it depends, I guess, if it was professional, but I feel like materials back, you know, back in the day were like you could buy that sketchy paint. And it would look and it looks like, you know, of that era. So it kind of like still has that vibe still where today, you know, you find something repainted. It probably was repainted with spray paint or something like that, you know. Yeah. So it's a little bit um, I think it's like a, a quality thing. But yeah. And like in general, the patina has like just made everything look like the same. Right. Age. Yeah. It and brings it. It brings it all together. Right. Yeah. So if someone did a, did a paint job just a few years ago, but the lugs are still like pitted or or foggy or rusted or whatever, then it's like sticks out like a sore thumb. Yeah, for sure. Um, what would be your like rarest, you know, top three kind of things that you've found either drum set, drum snare, any like symbols? What's your like like your absolute like happiest moment of like, I can't believe I found this thing. Mm -hmm um good question there's a few but um lately i recently just got this uh 20s 30s era leady and it's a 5 by 14 and a 14 by 28 and they're in the finish called jade green mm -hmm. so it kind of looks like a like a marbleish kind of finish um in this like pale green color yep um rare other you know without anything else but they're like new old stock wow. so it's like it's silly like the front bass drum head has a painting on it and if you look at it up close it looks like it was done yesterday and it's just Man. like the chrome is immaculate the wrap is crazy it's just like it's you're in a time machine because this is what you walked into a store back then that's how you saw it. Yeah. Which is kind of always, you know, I found I've, I've had sets in the past that were, were clean. You know, you find them every now and again, like really clean stuff and, you know, 60 stuff more so. Um, but to find something like that, you know, almost new old stock, it's kind of crazy. Cause I'm always like, um, if I could go back in time and walk into a store like that, just to see what all this stuff like, looked like brand new yeah you know because it's almost impossible to know because even if you clean it it's like you know that is maybe not what it looked like brand new like fresh you know yeah, fresh out yeah. of the factory so that one is definitely like my i'm riding that high still <laughs> was it in was it from like someone's basement or like a shop that closed or so that one came from a guy in michigan um i got the snare from a friend in brooklyn actually and so I just had the snare and then just randomly one day, a buddy of mine sent me a screenshot of this guy posting the bass drum on, on Facebook. And I didn't know that that existed at the time. So I kind of had to like jump through a few hoops to get it, but it, they were the, the original pair. They just had gotten split up. So they're both oh, equally man. as clean and I managed to get it, the bass drum back here. So they're back paired together and <sighs> You know, they're they're on my website, too. So if you want to take, take a look at them, you know, yeah. there's some good pictures. And uh, yeah, it's just cool to see. Yeah. I can't believe they were like separated and then came back together. Yeah, and I kind of it, it. It was a lot of work, but I guess that's the exciting thing, you know, is like the hunt and like, you know, reuniting and especially something that clean. It's like a lot of people like to separate those drums in that era because the bass drums are always big. And the snare drums are rare. So it's yeah. like, how many 28 inch bass drums do you want in your basement or in your, <laughs> you know, drum room? Yeah. When you could just have like a wall of snares and it takes up this much room. Yeah. And the snares are more like usable. Yeah. As right, opposed to a bass right. drum with no, no spurs or, you know, um, I feel like Mark Cooper would uh, eat that up with his love of the uh, green, the, the Jade oh, totally. green. <laughs> totally. I think yeah. I posted it in some of those groups and those guys definitely liked it. 
That's awesome. I mean, it 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 is very special. I mean, because everything, even when you look at the old catalogs or like a lot of things aren't even in color. So right. you can't or really get drawn. a good some of those or really drawn. early ones. They're just hand drawn. So it's like, you, who knows what it looked like new? Yeah, for sure. I've found, though, with like because like the hunt, it's it's kind of it reminds me of like putting together an episode of the podcast that's taken three years to get together and it finally happens and then you release it and then you're like, like you've chased down these drums and you've got them and then you just have to move on to the next one. Right. <laughs> you know, it's sort of a weird, oh, bizarre, know. like, I don't know. It's like psychology where it's like, you know, that like you're going to be really into this and then at some point it's going to be done and you're going to have to move on to something else. But like part of me is like, that's life, you know? Right. <laughs> yeah, I guess <laughs> to so. get to get unfortunately, deep. I think I, you know, realized that more too of like, okay, what's the next thing when I started to get more into like the Chicago drum show, like perfect example, like our first year, we just like brought a ton, but it was good stuff. Like I look back at my first year picture and I'm like, I would love to have all this stuff. It was like mod (laughs) orange, psych red, black oyster, blue oyster, everything, you know, just like everything. It was sick. But so then it's like, I'm like, well, what am I going to do next year? That's better and so it became this thing where i sort of compete with myself of past years where i'm like okay like this year was like top hat and cane and uh slingerland and abalone pearl like full set so it's like you know this is this was my fifth or sixth drum show um so i'm like next year i don't even know you know i'm gonna have to get (laughs) I got my work cut out for me, you know, so. Yeah. I mean, those are like, you can't, sometimes you're going to hit a point of like, I've hit the rarest drums in the world. Like, yeah. And I think with that, it's like, then, then you get into that territory of like famous drummers, drum sets. And that just scares me because it's like silly money, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Even like the rare stuff. I love it. And it's so exciting, but the money side of it is, is always tough because I know they're, the value is there, but, uh, you know, a drum set that's worth five figures is kind of crazy. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And then there's more like, um, I don't know. There's more like responsibility. I don't know how really, but like you just kind of like, like I know the guys who deal in those like ultra rare celebrity kits. And Mm -hmm. then you also open yourself up a lot to like criticism and like feedback of like, I can't believe this guy's charging this much. Right. But then who's making the vow? Who's cre- like, it's worth what someone will pay for it. Right. You know, um, it's interesting. Very, especially with the high dollar stuff. It's really. Yeah. And then are they playing it? Do you play this ultra rare drum or do you just like. I play the top hat set. Why not? Man, <laughs> How, where did you find that top hat kit? Um, I mean, that's that awesome. one I got from a collector out in Wisconsin, Chuck Scalia. Huh. Cool. That's awesome. Were yeah. they in good, sh- good shape and everything? Yeah, they're really good shape. There's a couple little problems, but it has some provenance to it. So it was the set that Ludwig used to scan the reissue. I think like the 90th. Uh, anniversary maybe when they did all those snares the new snares in the top hat set um yeah Hmm. this was like the i call it the grandmother you know (laughs) it birthed all these other drums the reissue you know it's the one that's the actual one they scan so and it's everything catalog correct i have the uh the salesman's binder oh man from that set so i have this like leather bound binder like stamped ludwig and ludwig with the guy's name on it and like gold leaf and you open it up and it's the full catalog with like the top hat set in it and stuff it's crazy it's like one of a kind thing so it's like how do you price it i think i have it low yeah it's like i don't know who's gonna buy it i don't know but i mean people can look and i'm sure i've 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 over the years of doing this have just grown to like you know ask the question what does something like that sell for i'm sure people are curious so just from talking to other other sellers especially those sellers that deal in that kind of price bracket let's say steve maxwell for example yeah, because yeah. he's he's a good example because I've, we've had these conversations about this drum set specifically um 
there's actually like a couple other top hat sets available. Tom Bennett, mm. I believe. So I kind of just went off of him because I believe he's sold a few in the past. And I know Steve sold a few in the past. And I think they've gone to like celebrities. I think like Johnny Depp is famously known for like having one of them. Really? Yeah. I didn't know that. <laughs> um, so it's like, I think some of them have sold to celebrities because they're kind of like known as like the rarest of the rare. Like, I think they really have this mystique to them. Yeah. So if someone with unlimited money is like, I want the rare drum, the rare drum set, that might be it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's like Nicolas Cage having a T-Rex skull or something. Right. right. <laughs> yeah. It's like, there's no, you know, it doesn't matter what it's worth re- yeah. really at that point. You know, it's just kind of yeah finding the right buyer that wants yeah. to, that doesn't care, you know? No, totally. That makes perfect sense. Uh, that'd be cool to have to not have to worry and just to say, oh, I want the rarest drum right. set, even not being really a drummer. Like he's known as like a guitarist and singer, but um, good. Good for Johnny. Um, <laughs> so totally unrelated. You guys have like lessons and stuff as, as well in your shop, which. Yep. So I used to work at the drum center of Cincinnati um, and I was I taught at Sam Ash and it's just like it seems like lessons are just kind of like an essential thing for a drum shop. Like when you open, it's just like something you got to do because it gets younger people and and just like people who are eager to learn in the door. And it like, it just, it's just such a good thing where then it, it makes it more of a hang where like people are hanging out in the, you know, main area waiting for their lesson and stuff like that. Um, what's your experience with, with giving lessons? Has it just been positive the whole time? Um, yeah, it's always been positive. I myself personally don't do lessons, but, um, our shop manager, Colin kind of handles that. And we have another guy that comes in and and handles the overflow, Hmm. but it's been great. It's a lot of, uh, we have a lot of young students, which is cool. And my side of it is I, I'm enjoying the younger students coming in because being a predominantly vintage shop too, it's nice to be able to like show this side of it as to like the, you know, the other place for lessons in town is like more, more school bandy, you know, everyone that works there is wearing a polo or in a tie yeah. and it's like, you know, it's a little bit yeah. more sterile. So you come in here and it's kind of a little bit punk rock and there's old drums and you know, we let the kids go up and play whatever. And sometimes Colin will go upstairs and, and do a lesson, you know, with a, with a seven year old and they're both on like a sixties Ludwig kit. So it's like, it's yeah. cool to introduce, you know, not only these cool collectible instruments, but it's also like a, a different sound that maybe they're not used to. Yeah. I know. Um, as a kid, I always enjoyed that more like the drum shop uh, vibe when I took lessons as opposed to like I live around the corner from a place that does a great job but they do like they do like violin and mm-hmm. they do like piano and it's just uh, it's I guess it's just different for what people are looking for yeah, but it's I a think different it's energy. yeah I mean it's cool to get you got to get people hooked and I feel like uh, in my experience because I never want to say stuff about what other people have experienced I've learned that the hard way of <laughs> don't say things like that but um, that like for me, it was more of a cool, like, this is a place to hang out. Do you guys do clinics and stuff like that? Um, we haven't yet, but definitely in the works. We're, we kind of like when we moved to this building, we were planning on it. And then with all the COVID stuff, I was like, I don't want to do an event if I don't know that, you yeah. know, in a few months, we're going to be able to do it. So yeah. now uh, we're actually in the works of planning some stuff because we just missed our one year on this building um so we're going to do a big event and whether or not it's going to be a clinic or or, or performance or something but um definitely something we're going to have in the future especially now that we're working with some more new brands too so it'll be nice to get some support and you know yeah whatever artist uh company they endorse you know for sure i mean it's cool and from again looking on your website seeing that you have newer stuff it's it's cool to just like I don't know. You can't like stick your heels in the ground and be like, we're only vintage. We're Mm -hmm. only selling, you know, 1920s drums. It's like people want new stuff. Why send them somewhere else? Like you got to do it all sticks and heads. And yeah. Yeah. I think it was when we moved 
year that I realized a little bit more of that um, in getting like the, you know, maybe getting some heads that are outside of my comfort zone. You know, it's someone coming yeah. in asking for like a frosted uh, EC2 from Evans. And I'm like, we don't have them now, but I'll get them, you know? And you yeah. know, we only had G2s at one or G1 and G2 and UV. It's like, we only had these like basic heads because that's, all you know myself and surrounding players just use the basic stuff that's kind of what lends itself to vintage drums is yeah a really simple drum head um so that was something we definitely learned more with this new location for sure you gotta like go out of your comfort zone sometimes and get things that other people like but i've also right. learned to, to not go too far out of my comfort zone because it's easy <laughs> to screw up and i i definitely I think when I first realized it, I went a little bit over and now I'm like reining it back and we're, you know, we're figuring out what the people that come here the most benefit from, but also like staying true again to just the authenticity of what wood and weather is, you know? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Which is very cool. I mean, the shop, I, I should have said this earlier, but geographically, we're really far apart. So I've actually not had the opportunity to come in. But um, Joe, this has been awesome, man. It's been uh, like I said, we've met a few times at the shows, but it's different when you sit down for an hour with someone and like kind of interview. It's it's cool to actually get to meet you and uh, and and talk more. Um, is there anywhere you want to like direct people to find the shop and uh, your online sales and all that stuff? Yeah, I would just say keep an eye on Instagram mostly. Um, it's kind of an ever changing app. So, you know, whatever you can do to keep up with the photos, we mostly post photos, not a lot of video. And I know the app it lends itself to video, but, um, you know, Instagram's the best place. We're posting new stuff all the time um, in the stories. You, kind of get early access to deals there. Um, but otherwise, woodenweatherdrumshop.com for everything else. Contacts there, address is there. Uh, right now we're open Fridays and Saturdays, 10 to 5. Most other days we're here too. So shoot us a line if you want to come by. Cool. And I like how you do like in like stories on Instagram and I assume Facebook, like orphan sales where you have like drums where like maybe it's the drum that you've been missing mm -hmm. like for someone. And totally. uh, or if you're trying to like put together a little like set where you don't care what is what like right. like ba bass drums, you could always use a cool bass drum, mm -hmm. you know, for like a studio or something. So yeah. it's, it's cool you do that. It's fun, man. And honestly, that's kind of like we kind of like what we talked about before is drawing inspiration from other you know, avenues where it's like, I, I'm into a lot of like vintage clothing and stuff like that. And a lot of those Instagram resellers are always doing, you know, selling on the story. So yeah. I kind of just took inspiration from that. And, you know, not, I don't think any drum shops were kind of doing on the fly sales, like on Instagram like that. So just kind of like took to that early. Cause inherently we've, you know, we have a lot of orphans. We acquire a lot of like pieces, you know, from buying collections and whatnot. So, they build up because we don't always put those ones online. So it's like a quick and easy way. And, you know, yeah, I let people know when we're going to be up there and it's kind of like a rapid fire thing. Yeah. Which adds to the like, like, oh, I got to buy it, you know, kind of <laughs> like, like it's <laughs> like, I got to get it yeah, now. But we and we price it for that, too. You know, sure. it's not like people are having to, like, make a split second decision if they want to buy this, you know, 13 inch rack tom for full market retail. It's kind of like. You know, here's this drum. It might be missing this piece, but it's like 90 bucks. So like, yeah, roll yeah. the dice or don't, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Very cool. Um, well, Joe is going to be kind enough to stick around for a Patreon bonus episode. Um, we're going to talk about how someone like Joe, who's 30, has acquired like this knowledge about vintage drums because to obviously own a shop and sell this stuff you kind of have to you really have to know what you're looking for for many reasons you could get burned by not knowing the right stuff you could uh you could run into problems and also just like people trust you with selling them uh you know the right gear it's not a mixture of wrong things put together that they rewrapped and all this stuff you, you want to know what you're selling so um he's got a lot of knowledge that he's acquired since doing this so we're going to kind of learn more about how to do that and and how to learn about uh, specific equipment and things like that. Um, so if you want to hear that, 
go to um, drumhistory.com. There's a Patreon button. There's also a new thing where um, on Instagram, you can now subscribe, which is like really new. So it just got set up where if people like the Instagram, you can pay 99 cents. And I'm going to start posting like, like I'll probably do like a little like thing where it's like, hey, this week's episode is with Joe from Wooden Weather and it won't be anywhere else. You can get behind the scenes stuff. So check that out. Um and it's all on Instagram, so you can see that. I guess Instagram is, like you said, ever-changing, and they're trying to do different things to make it so people can make money. Um, but anyway, so, Joe, thanks for taking the time to do this, man. I mean, I appreciate it. You're a busy guy, especially with a young kid. Uh, you understand the insanity uh, <laughs> that comes right. with that. <laughs> Very much so. Yeah, thanks for having me, man. I appreciate it. 